Good day. I'm Frank Williams, president of the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library and its association, headquartered here at Mississippi State University. And with me is William C. Jack Davis, who will deliver the third Frank and Virginia Williams lecture on Lincoln Studies. Today he will present a paper uh, and discussion on Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln as chief executives. So welcome, Jack. Thanks, Frank. Delicious. We've been friends for over 40 years. I was calculating this when you were the editor-in-chief of Civil War Times, yeah. which is still being published. Yeah, it's an old timer now. Exactly, and you've spent over 20 years in the publishing business, not just not as a renowned author of Civil War and Abraham Lincoln and other areas of interest. So tell us how you got into uh, publishing in the first place? Uh, like a lot of my life, it's accident. I guess I grew up in Northern California in a county that right now is evacuated thanks to the fires. And as an undergraduate, I wrote a couple of articles that were published in Civil War Times. I was maybe 19 or 20 at the time. And I continued to write for them. And when I finished graduate school, they asked me to come back to Pennsylvania for just a summer job as an intern. Uh, because I was due to go to the University of Chicago to work on a doctorate. And that was 1969. I got there. I liked the job. <clears throat> and I was beginning to see that at the same time that PhDs in history were going to be a glut on the market in the 70s, which in fact was the case. So they offered me a full-time job, and I stayed, and the summer job lasted 21 years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and we picked <clears throat> up our relationship when you were in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Right. So what, what was going on then? Uh, what, what was happening then? You had two great dogs, as, as I remember. And, mm. and they, I could hear them in the background when we first spoke on the phone. Uh, one of them was a, a Great Dane named Hannibal. He uh, was a dear, dear fellow. I still miss him. Um, everybody who knew him called him Butthead. He was not real bright, but he was a sweet, loving dog. And the other one was a German short-haired pointer named Cicero that we'd gotten at the, uh, right. uh, at the Humane Society. Right. And so we, you were still the editor of Civil War Times. I uh, think at that point I had sort of been bumped upstairs to being publisher of it and uh, all of our other magazines. At one point we had about 30 magazines, and I was overall editorial vice president for the, right. the corporation. And, and Civil War Times is still being published under a new ownership. Yeah. And there's a complete run of it in the Frank and Virginia mm -hmm. Williams collection of Lincolniana uh, in the in storage yeah. area and resource area for at, at Mississippi State University libraries. There's an inter interesting story about Civil War times. It was founded by a man who was virtually a second father to me named Robert Fowler. Who st it was a newspaper man from St. Petersburg, Florida, moved to uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to go to work for the paper there. And he had this idea for a Civil War magazine. So in 1959, he started publishing us on his own out of a walk-in closet in a spare bedroom in his house in Mechanicsburg. And uh, by the time I got there in 1969, 10 years later, he was beginning to think the magazine had run its natural life. The Civil War centennial had come and gone. He was starting a couple of other magazines. And so what happened was, in fact, the board of directors talked about euthanizing the magazine and trying to shift all its subscribers to one of the other newer magazines. What happened instead was it was just ignored. And by itself, it continued to grow and to grow and to grow until uh, when I started there, it had 15,000 subscribers. When I left, it was over 100,000. Which is a terrific number. And it's 60 number. years old this year. Yes, yes, and it's spawned exactly good. half a dozen other Civil War magazines as well. So that's the beginning of you as a publisher writer right where are you now what is your latest book which just came out and it's available uh, from amazon and other booksellers but also in audible which i yeah. listen to on a in a 40 minute commute in to providence from where hmm. we live and on the way out so i'm looking forward to not only the print edition but the okay. audible Good. edition I learned, oh, probably 20 years ago, that man doesn't live by the Civil War alone. So I found that about every other book, I would do something on another subject. And I'm deeply interested, have been for a long time, 
in this region that was called the Old Southwest. So I've done a book on the Natchez Trace, uh, I did a book on the, the Lafitte brothers, the privateers and smugglers in New Orleans, and this latest is a book about the British invasion of Louisiana in 1814-15, and of course the, the several battles for New Orleans. It's not so much just another battle book, though certainly that's a big part of it, but it's also a look at how that battle refocused the attention of the East, that is the east of the Appalachians on this region out here and the west. And really that focus never, never stopped. It kind of changed the definition of America, I think, in American minds because they were, thanks to the newspapers, we had this vigorous, vigorous press. Thanks to newspapers, everybody was reading about New Orleans. The news was a month old, but they were watching New Orleans intently and that focus never left and it, it, it kind of got you know, it makes Andrew Jackson president, for better or worse. It creates a whole new region of political influence that will be felt in Washington. So its, it's ramifications reached far beyond just the battle itself. It's a very good point that you raise on bringing attention to the west mm -hmm. of Appalachia. And uh, certainly Andrew Jackson, who was held in contempt by one of the judges there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he didn't pay the fine until his presidency. Isn't that right? Yeah, others paid the fine for him, but then he reimbursed them correct, later on. Correct, correct. Yeah, the, the judge held him in contempt, so he had the judge arrested. Correct. <laughs> he, he declared martial but law. That, that's the kind of rogue um, Andrew Jackson oh, was. Oh, very much, very much. And so, <clears throat> and effective though, effective. It, it was in the instance. Uh, Jackson, it, it's interesting that people talk about Jacksonian democracy. Uh, and Jackson certainly said all the, all the right things to say about democracy. But he had the instincts of a dictator. Yes, he did. He, uh, if you, you don't disagree with Andrew Jackson, or I'll arrest you. Uh, and very autocratic. Very autocratic. And uh, New Orleans was happy to put up with it until the battle was won. But then it continued. And they, New Orleans was not happy about that at all. And the one, the win, was after the, really, the war was over. Right, right. So it's interesting as a side story, but in Abraham Lincoln's cabinet room, which is the Lincoln bedroom now in the White House, it was then the executive mansion, there is a portrait, or there was a portrait in Lincoln's cabinet room of Andrew Jackson, the Democrat, and Lincoln, the Republican, and former mm -hmm. Whig. So I think there was a, not a symbolism here, but an indication by Lincoln of his determination and resilience. Yeah, yes, I, I think so. And and uh, if you'll notice frequently when the President Trump is speaking or interview, interviewed from the White House, there's a portrait of Jackson on the wall in the background. I think President Trump uh, prefers to identify himself with Jackson. Uh, and there are certainly some similarities. Uh, but, you know, Jackson's the first Western man to become president and that Lincoln is the next great Western man right. to become president. Right. So there is, a, there is a kind of a through line. Right, and um, I think too, because we're at the home of two great collections, I say modestly, the Frank and Virginia <laughs> well, I can Williams say it collection, you <laughs> thank you, of Lincolniana on, for Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War and the Ulysses S. Grant uh, collection both of which are housed here at Mississippi State, and I, we hope that people come by to visit the galleries and use the resources that are there. But as for Jack Davis, uh, I read your book on um, Grant and Lee, which is really a comparison of yeah. the two, which was a great analysis of how different and similar both leaders Very were, similar. both military leaders. And I think one of the points you made among many was that um, there was a difference in strategy and tactics among them, among them, the two of them. Could you tell our, um, our viewers wh what your take is on that? Um, in large part, I think their, their strategy was dictated by the circumstances into which they were thrust. Uh, Grant was very, but one thing they had in common, of course, is they both were deeply tied to the geography of the country they were to try to defend or to take and took the best advantage they could 
of the peculiar features of that geography. Everyone knows, of course, that uh, Grant launched his glory road on the rivers, the Tennessee and the Cumberland, Ohio, and eventually the Mississippi, and used them to carve up the Confederacy. Uh, Lee understood the geography of Virginia, and like Stonewall Jackson, was able to use the, Bo the Bull Run Mountains and the Blue Ridge Mountains very effectively in kind of controlling the war on one side or the other. Of them. Beyond that, I think their, their uh, tactical style perhaps may have been different, again, in part because of circumstances. Uh, uh, Grant was very, very content to leave lower level decisions to lower level officers. Lee was as well until the attrition of the war meant that by 1864 he was leading officers who were, had been captains and majors when the war began. Uh, they may not have developed the tactical instincts that Lee had or felt that he had. So he, I think, took a lot more personal hand in the operations of, of his subordinates than Grant. Indeed, probably a big difference would be that Lee was too patient and with people who perhaps should have been moved elsewhere or removed from command sooner. Whereas Grant, if you disappointed him too often, he, he just got rid of you. Right. And I think you too uh, point out also that this was an evolving uh, administrations of, of offices and leaders. And in Lincoln's case, you have a growing president who's evolving in office with very little military experience. Yeah. We'll get to that in a second when we talk about your book, Lincoln's Men. But you have Lincoln as commander in chief, you have Henry Halleck as the general in chief, and Ulysses S. Grant, this is now by 1864, as the, the general in chief. Right. And so that was, I think, the nebulous or the genesis of our modern command it is. staff system, it is. It, right? And I think, I think you do a splendid job in pointing that out. Uh, yeah. Grant, Grant really, in a place where Lee fell down somewhat is that his staff was way too small. Uh, he tried to do too much himself. Uh, staff members and close associates used to refer to him behind his back as the tycoon because he was doing everything. He was the big chief. And he, as a result, had to spend too much of his time on matters that should have been delegated to, to a staff person. He made some effective use of staff in the field during battles, but otherwise he could have made life a lot easier for himself if he'd had something more akin to a, a modern staff. But that would have been revolutionary in his time. The revolution was with Grant's staff, which by the end of the war is, what, over 30 people, something yes. like that? He's really created a series of professional niches and a cadre of staff officers to each specialize and carry out a specific task, all under his overall coordination. Uh, and it also created a, a better buffer between Grant and his corps commanders and his division commander, so he didn't have to be personally dealing with all of them all the time. He had this staff to take care of it. And it really, it's the precursor of the staff that uh, Pershing will have in World War I or the right. Ike on a right. vastly larger scale. In World and, War II. and I think, uh, <coughs> and, and <coughs> Grant, uh, until recently, does not get high marks as a president. Uh, yeah. But I think he took that ability to have a functioning staff into the White House with oh, him. Oh yeah, definitely. His, uh, part of the reason that he doesn't get high marks is that his choice of military subordinates was far better than his choice of, of some of his uh, yes. civil office yes. appointments. But historians more and more, and you see it now with Ron White's book and Ron Chernow's book, Grant is really getting the attention that he's been denied for so long. And what people are seeing is he is in some ways the first modern president. Uh, in the things he addresses, his involvement in, in foreign affairs, his efforts at uh, reform and things like uh, the, the uh, Department of the Interior and dealing with the Indian question. Uh, Grant is a fairly forward-thinking fellow out of the mold of post-Civil War presidents, really until you get to Grover Cleveland and even more so Teddy Roosevelt. And, and I think this is important uh, for us to remember. Th the Department of Justice was created That's right. That's right. during his administration and used <clears throat> to suppress 
white supremacist organizations that were thwarting mm -hmm. the civil rights yeah. amendments of the 13th, 14th, and 15th, and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is still law yeah. on, on yeah, the books. Right. So I, I think um, he's deserving of this credit that, that Ron Chernow and Ron White yeah. and Joan Waugh, for mm -hmm. example, right. uh, g give him. So I think, too, and I, I believe I've mentioned this to you in correspondence and when we met at the Lincoln Forum in Gettysburg, where we meet every November uh, 16 through uh, 18, how much I enjoyed Lincoln's men, mm -hmm. uh, the making of an army. This is Abraham Lincoln and how his only 90-day experience as a militia, first mm -hmm. a captain uh, 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 elected by his uh, company yeah. at 30 days <laughs> as a militia captain, and then re then he re-ups for two 30-day uh, stints. And even though he did not see combat, the fact that he was able to matriculate with his men, understand the hardships of yeah. sleeping on the ground, waiting for rations, not getting paid t in timely fashion, really, really did help him it, as yeah. the commander-in-chief when he was uh, confronted with civil war. Yeah. I think we have never had a president who had a greater capacity for empathy than Lincoln. And that brief experience, brief as it was, I think did give him an uh, understanding of several things. Number one, the nature of the volunteer soldier, who is not like a professional soldier. A uh, volunteer really is, is a civilian who considers himself on loan to the army, and they would behave accordingly. So I think Lincoln had some grasp of what it was like for the great bulk of the army he would be commanding in the Civil War. And also he understood something of their, their hardships and had, as you say, uh, some experience at least in the business of trying to, uh, to lead, to, to acquire their respect. He probably did it with homespun yarns and wrestling perhaps, but whatever it took. And that helped to hone his skills as a politician knowing how to get along with people, how to bring them around to your way of thinking, how to get them to do what you want them to do. Uh, as I'll say later in my talk today, these are skills Jefferson Davis never developed and wouldn't have if he could have, because he regarded it as pandering to the masses and undignified. But Lincoln understood that a leader, I think, sometimes may have to be a bit undignified in order to lead, in order to p make people follow. Like getting into the weeds. That's, yep. <laughs> yes. Yep. And I think, too, of, um, of how important it was for Lincoln to um, understand the troops, over two million mm -hmm. of them, yeah. I think, served in the, in the Union Army. Uh, un unfortunately, not all at the same time. Right. <laughs> right. So, and I think, too, uh, Jim McPherson, the, the great Civil War scholar, uh, points out that Lincoln, more than any other commander-in-chief, visited the field over 12 times. Yeah. Now, now to topographically and geographically, uh, this was doable in the states because we were confronted with civil war right. in, in the cockpit in Virginia and so on. But, um, and, and it's easier to get there than it is t in France during World War right. I or anywhere else, you know, in, in World War II or in our current difficulties in the Middle East. So I think that, that, was, that was an important... Um, oh, I, yeah, I think you cannot overestimate the importance of being seen. I mean, for a start, anybody who ever sees a president in the flesh never forgets it and tells the story and probably embellishes the story. Uh, but especially in a civil conflict like that, where you've got armies made up of men who really don't want to be there, but they're there. The idea of just being seen. And moreover, to be among them, which he was. And he wasn't reluctant even to look a little foolish when McClellan would put him on a short horse so that Lincoln's feet practically dragged the ground. The soldiers didn't laugh. And I, I swear it's almost as if there was a photocopying machine around in 1862 and 63 when you read the letters written by soldiers after Lincoln has reviewed the army and they, all, they say almost the same things. They say that a, a tree almost knocked off his hat or Lincoln's feet were dragging the ground, but nobody laughed. 
and they all talked about his face and what they saw in the face. And they all used the same adjective, careworn. They could see the toll that the war's responsibilities were taking on him, and that somehow bound their sympathies to him. And time and time again, if Lincoln was on a reviewing stand or something like that, you'll find soldiers saying, the president looked out over the crowd, and I think he looked at me. And of course yes. he wasn't, but that powerful connection of wanting to think, I had a moment with Abraham Lincoln. I think bound them to him personally in a way that perhaps no other soldiers have ever been bound to a president, maybe until FDR, and maybe not even then. And, and the respect <coughs> is what, what yeah. uh, we see here by soldiers that were being sent into battle with many casualties, mm -hmm. overall um, 750,000 north and south, that's the new figure, yeah. and yet they respected and loved him and, uh, and had great affection for him even when they were commanded by nincompoops <laughs> or, or less than competent yeah. uh, officers. Right. And, and that again you see in their letters sometimes with even the soldiers who know that the burden they bear, they will write in sympathy about Lincoln saying we can see the, we can see the great burden he carries. So they transferred in some degree their own concern about their own well-being to the president, who they can see he's almost Christ-like in a way, carrying the, the burden of the sins, or in this instance, the responsibilities of the nation on his shoulders. And the soldiers seem to see that. They certainly want to believe that, and that's important. Whether it's actual or not, if the soldiers want to believe that, then he's got the army in the palm of his hands. Yes, and he dies Christ-like yeah. too. Apotheosis, well, right yeah, there. When we when we think about <coughs> it during Holy Week and mm -hmm. shot on Good Friday and dying on Holy Saturday, tell us about a little bit about your biography of Jefferson Davis, Jack. Um, he's an interesting man. He's hard to like. Uh, biographers throughout history have had to face the hazard of falling in love with their subjects. And some have. It used to be said that Douglas Southall Freeman never got off his knees all the time he was writing his four-volume R. E. Lee because he just worshipped Lee. Uh, nobody worships Jefferson Davis. But there was, I thought, there was, a, was a, a void there, a very important figure, not fully understood. And uh, so it, it was a, a pretty big project. I wound up developing a lot of empathy for Davis. I'm not sure I would have liked him if I knew him but I can feel some empathy for the, the burden he had and the responsibilities he had to shoulder, and some respect for what he was able to do given the limitations of material resources and the limitations of his own personality. As Je Jefferson Davis had the instant, he'd have been a good banker or probably a, a good professional in some other category. He would not have been a good executive. It just wasn't his instinct. He was, he was a bureaucrat by instinct, and you've got to have bureaucrats, but you don't want them being your president. And as a result, Davis made a lot of his own problems, but he had a whole lot of other problems to face as well within the Confederacy and the nature of its leaders, and dealt with many of them pretty effectively. He would never be, I think, ranked as a great president, but I think he's certainly, if he was included in these rankings that are done of US presidents, I think he would rank somewhere in the middle, probably. It was a long project, and uh, it wasn't always easy. Lincoln could probably have written a telephone book, and it would have been interesting reading. Uh, <laughs> Davis could not <laughs> uh, read it. And I read virtually every, all of his letters, and uh, there are no laughs in there. He didn't have a sense of humor. Right. And, and frequently, it's highly legalistic and difficult to stay with, with what he's saying. But over time, I think I came pretty close to understanding him. He's, he's been regarded often as, one of his friends called him the Sphinx of the Confederacy, uh, an unknowable uh, uh, being. And I don't think he's that difficult to understand. Uh, but he is difficult for many people to, to feel any empathy for because he's, he's so cold and aloof. So and so little for a sense of humor from yeah, him. Yeah, oh yeah. I can't remember a joke. So 
One of his saving graces, <clears throat> one of the things I enjoyed the most, however, is that you would see in Davis, if he was with children, his personality changed. He, he did not have a happy childhood himself. His father was so distant that he didn't approve of his children speaking at the dinner table. And in his own memoir, Davis wrote that he could only remember one occasion when his father hugged him. It, it was a loveless upbringing so far as his father was concerned. And I think as a result, Davis felt a lot of sympathy for children. And he just loved being around kids. Especially at Christmas time, he would get under the Christmas tree and start handing out presents. He'd give the wrong present to the wrong child. He didn't care. He just had a good time. And apparently he could laugh. And that's, and that's a, I think that's a little peak inside the Marble Man that gives him a lot more humanity. So the tragic irony of losing his young son uh, in, in uh, Richmond at yeah. the White House of the Confederacy uh, and his fall that yeah. uh, certainly uh, was tragic and I think affected uh, the Davises uh, oh, sure. immensely. And they'd already lost another son in the 1850s. And then this, this boy, it was in April 64, Davis was in meetings planning the spring campaigns and heard the outcry, went <coughs> and held his dead boy in his arms and then forced himself to go back to his office to try to go back to work because the pressure on him was so great. Uh, he couldn't that evening. He finally just told everybody to leave, saying, I must have this time with my, my dead son. Yes. But there was a lot of sadness in his life. Uh, the death of his first wife, Sarah Taylor, probably affected him for the rest of his life. Uh, sure. He, he was much more exuberant. He was kind of a... He was sort of a frat boy type at West Point. He got in trouble a couple of times, dismissed once, and then allowed to come back. He played, <clears throat> played pranks, got in trouble, went to Benny Haven's Tavern, which was off limits. Um, and he wooed Sarah Taylor and persuaded her to come back to his plantation in Mississippi, saying it would be safe. It wasn't the fever season. But she came back with him right after they got married. They both got the fever and she died. And you know, this is psychoan <coughs> pardon me, psychoanalyzing now. But I think he had to feel responsible for her death and may never have gotten over it. And the impact that had, I think, was that he had been so wrong in something that cost him so much, he could not make himself face the possibility of being wrong ever again. He always had to be right and had to impose his views or his judgment of what was correct on others. That's the only way in which he could work with people. And I think it may all go back to the death of Anoxie Taylor. Interesting point, very interesting. As a last uh, area of discussion, that's more au courant and contemporary to us, is the issue now <coughs> surrounding Confederate statuary and memorials and it's not just Confederate yeah. leaders that we're talking about. Christopher Columbus in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. in my state is uh, the, the statue in memory of him has suffered vandalism and efforts to relocate it. Yeah. And you did a piece that was really very early on in the lost cause yeah. uh, dilemma, <coughs> kerfuffle, if you will, uh, that uh, had a way out, an exit strategy. And why don't you tell our viewers uh, your take on this and, and how you feel about it? Sure. I think that was in the Wall Street Journal four or five years ago. Uh, I think to start, it's understandable where the outcry is coming from and why it's coming. Whether you agree with it or not, I think well, you can at least see that there is a point there. Uh, but whether that point should be driven to the extreme that it has been is entirely a different matter. Uh, we're, we're bodlerizing or uh, trying to sanitize our own past in a way, which I think is not healthy. When there's so much that instead can be learned from these people, these Confederate leaders, um, and Columbus, and others, by the way, um, uh, without necessarily having to try to expunge them somehow. Uh, I'm much more in favor of, of 
interpretive signage, that sort of thing, to explain why was this statue put here uh, in 1895 rather than in 1865? Uh, what did he or she stand for? Uh, what did they mean in their time and place and to the people who were, were listening to them? And how does that fit into the overall continuum of American history as we constantly march more toward more small l, liberal, small p, progressive views on man, women, and their places in society? learn from them rather than trying to put them out of our way. I visited Budapest uh, seven or eight years ago, a beautiful city I just loved. When the Soviets pulled out, Budapest, like all of the cities in the old Eastern Bloc countries, was full of this hideous old uh, Soviet statuary uh, of Lenin, well, Lenin and Stalin for a while and military leaders and all that. And some cities just destroyed all of that. The mayor of Budapest said, we can't do that. We can't afford to forget. So what they did do is they picked them all up and they moved them across the Danube and created what they call Memory Park. And you can go there today. It's, it's really interesting. It's kind of creepy, actually. But you can see all these monoliths commemorating this repressive regime. And I think it's a very eloquent reminder of, of the price you can pay if you don't watch for your freedoms. Yes. And I. I if statues are moved, I think that's really kind of up to the people who live there. After all, uh, why does somebody today have to worship the gods of generations ago? I'd rather see today's people create, put up new monuments or new street names in honor of today's heroes. Uh, in Richmond, Arthur Ashe is on Monument Avenue with Lee and Jeb Stewart and Jackson. There are plenty of people that could be who can be role models today, who can be honored without necessarily having to bodlerize or erase those from before. I wouldn't be surprised but what we may wind up eventually with something like that. I think the furor, this is an old story, by the way. It didn't just come about in the last few years. Back in the 1960s, there were movements in uh, Nashville to get rid of a bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest that was on the Capitol steps. Uh, a statue of Jeff Davis is in a park in Memphis overlooking the Mississippi that there were once moved to, uh, to get rid of. Uh, I think if people keep clear heads and just show a little patience, most everybody can be, can be satisfied. We're no longer necessarily glorifying slavery or a cause that was formulated around and principally in existence because of slavery because we have a statue of Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis. Uh, read an interesting book, and I'll call close with this, not long ago, about the Zulu War of 1879 in South Africa by a modern military historian. And they have some of these same issues there as well, because there are some statues of some British uh, soldiers that are controversial in, in, in uh, Natal in South Africa. And uh, the author closed with a plea, saying, why can't we honor bravery and sacrifice without feeling that in doing so, we honor the cause in which they were demonstrated? And I think that's not a bad approach to take. I agree, and uh, I think it points out the, the fact that that we as a country or as in citizens in our great country are not necessarily patient or no. discerning and able to discern between sacrifice, bravery, and a cause yeah. as ill-conceived as it may have been uh, in, in their being presented in uh, a memorial fashion, mm. so to speak. Yeah, uh, to, we risk cannibalizing our own past and a great deal of our own culture. Uh, the, the reparations movement actually is also kind of you know, a, a co-adjunct of this as well. And where do, once you start, where do you stop? Uh, any descendants of ancient Britons ought to go after Rome for reparations for the conquest in 45 BC. Right. <laughs> I mean, once you right. start it, how far do you go? So this is a bit somber to conclude <laughs> our discussion, Jack. Well, the but, Romans are always but, somber. But, <laughs> but hopeful in the sense of uh, our presence at Mississippi State University and the, the uh, 
uh, Lincoln and Grant galleries. Imagine Ulysses S. Grant returning to Mississippi uh, because uh, it is part of our history and I think has been well received by Mississippians ah, yes, that's and many who've uh, visited uh, the gallery as well as uh, Lincoln who was the wartime president of the North. So we hope you will visit uh, the galleries here at Mississippi State University Libraries and join us if you can today when we have Jack Davis deliver his uh, Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln as chief executives. So with that, uh, a God bless you and goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Great pleasure. Okay.